Hey everyone, welcome to another Facebook Live, uh, Clean Machine Live rather. I'm Jeff Palmer, CEO and founder of Clean Machine. And today we're going to talk about something negative. That's a little joke. It's a <laughs> workout joke. So uh, the positive and the negative lifts of working out. Uh, interesting study. It's a small study, but I like to go over even small studies because they can give us helpful information that we can test out on our own um, and give us a glimpse inside of what may be happening, even though it's not conclusive research. Um, so let's take a look at the study. I will copy the study and post it in the comment section so that everyone can read along. And I will also post the link to, like I do with all the research. And there's the link in the comments section. All right, let's go ahead and pull that up on the screen. So uh, the study is called the comparison between concentric only and eccentric only and concentric and eccentric combined in resistance training of the elbow flexors for their effects on muscle strength and hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is muscle gains. So that's the size of the muscle getting bigger as opposed to just the strength of the muscle getting stronger. All right, <clears throat> so what is the difference between eccentric and concentric? Concentric, let me go ahead and take this off the screen. Concentric is just like what it sounds, which is concentrating or uh, squeezing the muscle so that it's condensing or contracting. Uh, so that is concentric. And then eccentric is the movement away. I'm talking about for this muscle, actually, when you uh, are concentric on the bicep, at the same time, you're uh, eccentric on the uh, tricep, generally. So when you squeeze that, this one is in a more relaxed mode where the bicep is in a more concentrated mode. Conversely, as you are releasing downward, um, you, this is an eccentric movement where the muscle is elongating instead of contracting. So the when people, let's say, do a bicep curl, so the standard bicep curl when you're standing, right, is you pull the uh, uh, weight upward, and that is uh, concentric for the bicep. And then a concentric motion, what most people do is just let the weight drop, let gravity pull the weight down, and then do the curl, the concentric part. Well, so what they looked at in this research was if you're doing a curl, and uh, what if somebody actually helped you? So they had a assistance actually lift the weight up so they weren't doing the concentric work, and then lowering the weight slowly, that is allowing the muscle to be engaged during the eccentric motion or the, uh, the extending motion of the bicep and then measured what happened as far as strength and muscle size. Now, what they found in the study, and I'm going to go ahead and um, read it uh, right off the screen. So um, what they found was th there was no significant changes in measures uh, were evident in the control group. So they had a control group, and then they had, so four groups total. They had the uh, eccentric only, the concentric only, and then the eccentric and concentric together, which is standard workouts if you're focusing on the negative part as well as the positive part of the lift. And then, of course, a control group. So there was no changes in the control group, as expected. Uh, and there were increases in the um, uh, concentric, and there were kind of increases in the concentric and eccentric. But what they found was interesting is that the uh, eccentric only uh, had not much significant difference in the difference between the concentric. So standard workout of using the concentric motion only and then letting gravity drop your weight down as opposed to somebody else lifting up the weight and then doing the eccentric motion only, I actually found not a whole lot of difference between the two. Uh, even if you were doing very uh, slow up raise, which is a concentric movement, and then a slow down raise, which is the eccentric or negative part of the motion, they didn't find much difference there either. 
So <laughs> this was interesting because they said, well, wait a minute, even if you're doing up and down, you're, you're controlling the work, you're controlling the weight up and down, you're putting in basically twice as much work, right? Because you're actually having to use energy to control the weight up and down. But it didn't result in that big a difference, uh, statistically difference, if you were just lowering the weight. So this tells me that it's important to incorporate that, to make sure you're getting that into that um, because it can be just as effective at help building strength and muscle as the eccentric only and then just letting the weight drop by gravity itself. So when you're working out, try to use that to your advantage, which is basically increase, uh, making sure you're strong through the full contraction, the full range of motion, and then lowering it to with uh, allowing the resistance there of holding the weight up all the way down so that you're getting a full both eccentric and concentric positive and negative uh, stimulation on the muscles and that can help you actually increase the volume of your size of your muscle because you're actually doing double the work instead of half of the work and half of the work being done by gravity you're doing half of the work and the other half of the work so you're getting twice as much work on the muscle so this is just a real small technique that you can incorporate into your workouts um, to make sure you're maximizing the benefits of a resistance style training now i'm going to show you um other techniques and I'm using bicep uh, contractions or bicep curls as an indicator. So when you are uh, in the bicep curl and you are contracting, if the weight gets to a certain point where it's vertical, then this becomes non-engaged. The muscle becomes non-engaged, it's soft. But if you tilt forward a little bit and now the weight is still vertical to the ground, now the muscle is fully engaged and it's it's stronger so what you can do is just slightly change the tilt or direction of that to get more of a contraction out of there it's i call it a max contract so you can use cables to do this like in cables when you're doing a cable curl the cable is still pulling the same amount of weight up all the way through the motion of the uh, weight. So that can get you stimulation through the whole movement instead of if you were actually using a dumbbell, this is where you'd get most of the contraction right here. There'd be nothing because gravity is doing the work for you and your muscle doesn't really need to engage. You can see muscles not engaged there. Now, if you tilt this way, now you've got it at a contract position, but your fort, the weight is pulling down on you. So you're contracting the muscle, fully engaging it. So just by changing the degree of tilt, maybe the pitch of your hand to the turning of your hand. So here is something that uh, is also, so when you're looking at the muscle here and there is a full contraction, that is engaging the muscle a little differently than if you tilt the hand. See how the muscle changes? it elongates based on the uh, the uh, pitch of the hand. So the way you position your hand, if you are uh, positioning it this way, it's going to be different than a pitcher or a hammer curl. So it's going to affect the muscle differently. It's going to stress the muscle differently. So changing the pitch of your hand, changing the angle at which you uh, address it, and then maybe even using machines or other uh, equipment can keep that full engagement. What you want to focus on here to maximize muscle stimulation without having to use heavier and heavier weights, of course, that's one way to do it. But uh, for older people or for people who have injuries or people who have t uh, uh, soft tissue issues uh, like cartilage damage or things like this, that's not a good idea. So I want you to lift safe and uh, practice what they call safe sets, <laughs> safe sets of weightlifting. 
Okay, and to do that, you, you simply just need to make sure that you're getting resistance. Now, there's another uh, practice uh, called uh, three second holds. So what you can do is get into a motion where you're fully contracting the muscle and then in its tight squeeze, you're holding it for a couple seconds to maximize the amount of contractility in the muscle. And what that does is the muscle actually holds onto something called arachidonic acid, so omega-6. That arachidonic acid then can squeeze out of the muscle and that is a cell signaler to tell the body to come over, repair the damage, and to actually stimulate the muscle growth. So the more you can concentrate on the, uh, the contraction of the muscle, the more you can actually potentially stimulate the muscle to grow or to respond in a uh, response of uh, getting it to heal, repair, and grow and add muscle. That is the adaption process. You've got to get the muscle to adapt to something that it's doing. When you put the work in, the body has to adapt. That's why doing the exact same thing when you go into the workout of the gym, the body stops adapting because it's not something new. Simply by changing the angle, changing the weight, changing the pitch of the hands, all these subtle small changes using a machine, using a different motion, these can all help and keep changing the stimulus so that the body continues to adapt. This is how you can keep the, adata, uh, the adaptation part of the muscle response in a higher and higher thing. So, you know, when I see people coming in and doing the same old stuff every day, and they're not changing, they're doing the work, you know, putting in an hour in the gym, but they're not changing in the physical nature. And then they see me and, you know, it's like, well, how do you get like that? Well, it's because I'm constantly changing up my workouts to keep my body in an adaptive mode, an adaptive stress. So our body has these really cool um, intracellular structures um, that control adaptation. Uh, they're called heat shock proteins. Check out my video on heat shock proteins. It'll show you a little bit more. But what they do is they adapt to the stress. So they're protein folding mechanisms. There's these little balls of protein that actually take the proteins and fold them into particular shapes. And that's what actually forms muscle tissue, forms bone tissue, forms all of the different tissues in our body. And it knows to take these long strains of proteins and fold them down into exact forms and shapes, three-dimensional shapes, that's what gives that protein an identity. That's an eye cell, that's a, a heart muscle, that's a lung cell, that's a bone cell, that's a, that's a uh, bicep cell. These are different proteins that are folded in this way. And these heat shock proteins do that. But what they also do is they grab information on what kind of stress is happening to the cell and then they can adapt to that. Maybe make the cell itself stronger. Maybe recruit a new cell. That's called hyperplasia. Instead of hypertrophy, hypertrophy is taking a single cell, like a muscle cell, and making it larger or stronger or denser in protein. Whereas uh, uh, hyperplasia is actually the recruiting of more muscle cells to be able to handle that stress. Now, what you see in uh, bodybuilders is more the focus on making that cell larger because you get bigger muscles out of it. Whereas guys that are working out with heavier and heavier weights, power lifters, weight lifters, they're actually working on more on muscle cell recruitment or hyperplasia so that they have more cells to carry that weight and can handle that uh, weight. So it's two different uh, forms of adaptation. Now, if you train both for strength and for uh, hypertrophy. So strength is lower reps, generally higher weight amounts, and hyper hypertrophy training is usually the middle size weights, not extraordinarily heavy, but enough to do eight to 10 to 12 reps, somewhere in there. That's where you get the maximum amount of growth by, by most of the research that's out there. So two different ways of training when you can incorporate both of them and use an adaptive style of training along with your negatives as well, your concentric and your eccentric motions, 
keep them engaged while you work out, and this will give you the best results in the gym. These are tips I share with you based on the research that's out there. And again, I share the studies in the comments so you can read them before. Now, this is just a small study done on it, but it's a glimpse. It's more information. And for me, I share all the information that comes in out there, even if it's not the best study, even if it's not a very high quality study, I still like to share it because it's information. Do it with you want with the study. If you think, oh, that's a garbage study, it's not enough people, I'm not gonna put any weight to it, that's fine. But if you say, well, wait a minute, let me test this out in the gym, see how it works for me, and see if that does anything better and it works for you, well then great, that's useful information. So it's up to you. I leave that up to you to decide whether this information is useful or not. I give you the link so you can look at the studies yourself, but I also wanna provide this information for you just in case you want to try to incorporate this and see how it works for you. Everybody's an individual. Everybody has different ways of, uh, of seeing these things. So that's why I share it with you. I hope you enjoyed this one. Have a great holiday. We're gonna be, well, I'm going to be taking a little break from Facebook Lives and Clean Machine Lives for a little, little bit, but I'll be back in January with some more great info for you. Uh, I've got some really good studies and some cool guests as we lead up to the vegan World Vegan Bodybuilding Championship at the Vegan Health and Fitness. This is us uh, promoting the show along with SoFlow Vegans and the NGA. Check them out. Check out uh, the show at VHF for Vegan Health and Fitness Expo, vhfexpo.com. Find out more how you can be a vendor, how you can be a competitor in the, in the World Vegan Bodybuilding Championship, the only 100% vegan bodybuilding championship in the world, or just show up and be an attendant. Enjoy. We'll have great speakers. We'll have great music. We'll have even uh, a whole obstacle course that you can get into. So come out, have some good tasting vegan food, healthy vegan food, uh, some treats, some supplements, some great vendors selling all kinds of vegan lifestyle uh, products and services all for you, plus some great speakers and maybe even a few celebrities too. So find out more as we get closer. It's April 15th of 2023. I hope to see you there. Have a great weekend and happy holidays. Merry Fitness and a healthy new year.